Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, and I'm here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom. And this is our temporary final, if that can be our concept for the day, temporary final episode. Um, We have run through the entire Old Testament, and we made a lot of recommendations about books and food. And then we listened to your recommendation about books and food and music and stuff. And today we're going to kind of do a retrospective on everything we've said so far. Um, But before we get to that, we missed a recommendation from last time. It was buried in my inbox and I'm so sorry, but here it is. This is also from Gwen. Thank you so much, Gwen. Hi, I would like to recommend the book Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking by Susan Cain. I've had this book on my to-read list for a long time and finally read it. I really appreciated what she had to say in the beginnings that it used to be that people used to be rather quiet. The important things were character and doing what was right. Beginning with Dale Carnegie, things began to change. People were expected to be assertive and well-spoken and able to sell themselves. Now with the advent of social media, we see where this has led. I enjoyed the book and learned much from it. Thank you so much, Gwen. Have you read this book, Greg? I have not. My wife bought it and read it so she could understand me. (laughs) (laughs) Apparently she thinks it helped. So there you go. Oh, that's good. good. Mm -hmm. Have you read it, Brian? No. I have heard of it. Uh, and it may or may not have been recommended to me in times past. Yeah, I don't remember for sure. It sounds familiar. Yeah, I'm kind of in that boat. I definitely have heard of it and haven't carved out the space to read it. But I'm glad to hear that it's good. And it sounds really interesting f- from the historical perspective, mm-hmm. especially. I hadn't heard about that aspect of it. No, I hadn't either. All right. So today... The title of our show, Halting Towards Zion. This was the title of the series of articles that you wrote, Greg, um, from which we drew the content of the show. Halting. Why halting? That's an old-fashioned word. It One, it sounded better than limping. Yeah, limping sounds lame. Mm-hmm, which, ha, uh-huh. kind of what's going on here. <laughs> it's also an allusion to a particular story in Genesis, which you also allude to every time we begin. Jacob wrestled with God and at Penina, Penina and then uh, God would not, he would not let God go. So God touched the hollow of his thigh, and his thigh went out of joint permanently, apparently. Uh, and that's where God named him Israel. And But from that day, as he left and as the sun rose upon him, he halted upon that thigh, upon that leg. Jacob would spend the rest of his life, we would say, limping. Mm -hmm. But anytime anyone would ask him, hey, Jacob, Israel, what's that with the limp? He would say, that's where I wrestled with God, and I won. Sort Mm -hmm. of. For God let me win. Um, (laughs) Sometimes you have to wrestle with God before he lets you win. And this this incident, this story, shines light backward and forward upon the whole history of the Old Testament. As we can go back to Genesis 3.15, the Proto-Evangelium, where God promised Eve that her seed would crush the head of the serpent, but in the process, his heel would be bruised. In other other words, he'd limp. He'd be hurt. The devil would be smashed to pieces (laughs) by comparison. You know, your skull gets crushed. That's pretty much it within a short time, at the very least. If you bruise your heel, you probably get better eventually with proper treatment. Resurrection is pretty good treatment. (laughs) <laughs> um, and so Jesus came into this world humble, laying aside his glory, not taking on Satan with sheer power and force, uh, but as one lowly and weak to all appearances, 
and he won by dying, not the world's normal concept of <laughs> how you win things. And if we go back and we look at the whole Old Testament, we see this pattern played out many, many times where God does not win. Well, you can think of the, the ten plagues. There God won with a lot of force and glamour and power and special effects. That didn't happen very much. Usually it was something very, very different. A little boy with a sling, a man praying for rain when there's not a cloud in the sky. You know, you can walk through the Old Testament and look at all the times. A man with a with long hair and the um, jawbone of an ass. Another man <laughs> with a long wooden goad. Um, you know, you, some you, building you, permits. <laughs> yeah, uh, and the um, the left handed guy with the long the long dagger. Mm -hmm. There's there's room here if anybody's interested to talk about God's sense of humor. Mm -hmm. Uh, as as devout Christians, sometimes we we miss the way God tells stories. He's not Hollywood. He's not even Broadway. And a lot of the stories in Scripture spin around odd, seemingly insignificant, even laughable solutions. Uh, a baby in a manger, a man dying on a cross, really? Yeah, that's the story. And it's it's a sort of tongue-in-cheek approach to the whole battle. God could have smashed Satan in a second, but he left him around as a sort of plot device to cause trouble <laughs> and to um, be somebody he could play off of, a foil, I guess, so that he, not with sheer power, but with wisdom and mercy and grace and a sense of humor for the most unlikely thing around, pulled off the story we know, we know as the Old Testament of the coming of Christ. So there, there's, there are things there to consider about the nature of our God and how he gets things done. It's almost like he's, you know, he let Jacob win in mm -hmm. the wrestling match, right? In the same way, like he, he let Satan get a hit in, yeah. you know, it's like he did it with one hand tied behind his back. Yeah. Like that's the sense of this, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, that's exactly it. And if you think about doing anything with a blister on your heel... Like it's a little thing, but oh, it's annoying. It's like the worst <laughs> thing in the world when you when you've got one. <laughs> oh. Or a bone spur. Ooh, I've had those before. Mm. It's like hopping mm -hmm. around. But yeah. I think Thanks. Chesterton said the worst pain in the world that anybody's ever felt is the toothache that someone has right now. <laughs> 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 so present. So that's the halting part. Mm -hmm. How about the toward? The <laughs> toward. <laughs> Let's let's analyze all of it. This is a yeah. sentence diagram. Okay, this is a diagram three part a essay, sentence. three paragraph. <laughs> uh, toward signifies that we're not there yet. Uh, the Old Testament saints were not there yet. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. But they that say such things say clearly they they seek a city. So there's a movement through the Old Testament, not simply through time, but in terms of deeper revelation, more clues, more, more hints about what's coming, uh, and, and a greater revelation of the one who's laying the hints, the breadcrumbs that are leading you on to something. And occasionally you get a glimpse of that something. It's it's big and it's beautiful and it's bright and there's love and there's joy. But exactly what form it's going to take is a little unclear. City, a city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Uh, as I told you before, when I was a small child in, in my Christian school in chapel, our pastor used that phrase and it seemed overwhelmingly significant. Uh, I think it was Lewis or was it Wordsworth who said charged with significance, <laughs> but no one ever explained it to me. And I just, I, all I could remember foundations. Well, Jesus is called the foundation. I wonder if it never got any further than that, hmm. but it, it stuck with me. And I wonder how far the Old Testament states got with it. a city. Well, they would understand that to mean community, people, communicating with one another, sharing with one another, working side by side. And in, as we've seen many times by now in the ancient world, uh, communicating and working in terms of a common religion, a common worship, where 
your identity is defined by the one you worship. And in this city, we'll all have the same identity. We'll all worship that one God and be part of that same family, that same city, that same community and kingdom. And it will be good and it will be wonderful. And somehow it will be better than anything the world's seen. But what is that still doesn't say a whole lot. Will I will it be in, you know, Jerusalem or St. Louis, Missouri or London mm-hmm. or Paris or Moscow or Constantinople? Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City. Um, is it that kind of city? And, and what will we do there and what will it be like? And, and and then the other part of this, we're going toward it. How are we going to get there? Is it just enough that time passes and God drops clues and eventually one day, bye-bye, here it is. It's never that easy. In the Old Testament, saints understood that there were things they had to do. Each one was called upon something. And here's Hebrews 11. Abel offered a sacrifice. Enoch walked with God. Noah built an ark. Abraham went out looking for this city. Jacob uh, worship leaning on his staff. Jo- Joseph made uh, mention concerning his bones. Moses forsook Egypt. And so on. Each one was called to do something that in terms of the of what was going on in the world seemed a little weird. Back to that idea of God's sense of humor. Uh, yes, they had to not kill people and not commit adultery, not steal and all that. But in each <laughs> case, there was also, there tended to be a special mission, special role that each one took up that somehow moved everybody closer to the goal. (laughs) And still, they saw it afar off. They didn't know what exactly they were dealing with. But there was this mention of this seed, seed of Eve, of um, Shem, of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, of Judah, of David. So we're getting the idea it's a person. And the further we go, we get other clues, a king, a prophet, a priest, or are there three of them or two? Can one person do all that? And what's this about suffering and dying? And what's this about writing forever? That sounds like two different people, right? <laughs> Surely you can't do both. No. How could you possibly do both? Well, how could, how could it be David's son and David's Lord? I don't yeah. understand this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's, yeah. Psalm 110, it gets repeated more than any other psalm in the New Testament. The Lord said to my Lord, how how is he the everlasting Father, the mighty God, Prince of Peace, and yet suffering and dying? Thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. They got they got the pieces, they got the bits, but it's a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, the one thing that God required of them is that they believed it, that he had a plan that he was giving them pieces of it, and although they may not understand all of it, he would be faithful, he would keep his word, he would save his people from their sins and from the consequences of sin. And how that was going to play out, they did not know. So over the last three years, we've seen the covenant formatting change. We start with patriarchs and and relatively small families, Um, And then one of them gets called aside into a particular land with a particular right that sets him and his seat apart from everybody else. Uh, But then they go down to Egypt and they become a great people and God exoduses them out and makes them a nation, a kingdom with laws and governments and puts them back in the land, which they will now defend with military force and and they will also drive out the inhabitants. And then that gets converted into a kingdom with royalty and monarchy and palaces and a standing army, and then eventually a temple. And that goes on for a while, but then God smashes all that and scatters his people and calls them back to a little temple in a no-account city in the middle of a huge gentle, Gentile empire. And at each step, people are going to say, well, when God fixes things, it will be like, and what do we always think of? The good old days. (laughs) Now, you may be too young uh, that you've escaped this, but when I was a kid, say, in the 70s, maybe the 80s, if you wanted to talk about the good old days, you were talking about the 50s. Though we still saw in black and white reruns on late night TV, (laughs) Leave it to Beaver and My Three Sons and Ozzie and Harry and all that, because, you know, that was the America people remembered uh, where there wasn't any swearing and cussing on TV and no sex scenes and every story had a happy ending and everybody was 
middle class and own their own home, two cars in every garage. It was, it doesn't get any better, right? And the church was respected and God was respected. Everybody said they were a Christian. Yeah, you can't go back. Something that I've encountered, and perhaps you have too, uh, is a, is the the temptation of Christians to single out one era in history and say, our homes, our families, our churches need to be like that. Mm -hmm. The 50s, Victorian England, Jane Austen's England. <laughs> the uh, Puritans. The Puritans, Puritan New England. Uh, and then you can go back to Calvin's Geneva or further, further, further back to Alfred's England or to Arthur's Britain, someplace, surely. How about the first century, the first century church, where they, they, they still had apostles, and they had it all together, right? Ah, uh, about <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, Corinth, Laodicea, Sardis. You could go all the way back to Eden. Yes, you could. And so there is wisdom and instruction to be drawn from the past. We try to put together the clues they were given. Because we should be a little smarter, know a little more. God's spoken a whole lot more. <laughs> but to try to focus on some time period in the past and say, if we just made our homes and our churches like that, then we'd get it. It was a serious misunderstanding of God's plan for history. If um, Here's one. If the church in the 21st century were more like Rome in terms of visible unity, doctrinal coherence, everyone respecting one another's courts, if we all ecumenically came together as one church, wouldn't that be so much better? You, you just end up with what Rome already <laughs> is, which is a bunch of people that are under just, I guess, just like a, a foe. Yeah, nominal. That's the good, that's the word I was looking for. Mm -hmm. A nominal unity. Yeah. Because... Even now within Rome, you have radical traditionalists rubbing mm -hmm. shoulders with postmodern queer, gender queer kind <laughs> of people, like with the colored hair and everything. Like mm -hmm. this is not, <laughs> it's not what the propaganda, what the, uh, the yeah. marketing says it is. Rome sweet home. Yeah. <laughs> not really. So the toward. Is that we're, we're going someplace and we're halting, which means this is not because we're so strong and great and wise. Uh, we're, we're, we're halting because we, we've we picked up our Savior's lip. Uh, he could, upon leaving, he could have said, all right, you're all full of the Spirit. Go out, do miracles, raise the dead, bring up fro frogs and flies, <laughs> blot out the sun and moon, uh, raise, you know, do whatever. And cities will fall before you, and people will convert. And he didn't do that. He he left behind kind of ragtag band of people, some of whom were kind of educated, some of whom were kind of not. And the appeal was very early to slaves and to the underclass. Uh, he it reached some rulers and kings, priests and such, but. Christianity has never been an upper-class movement. Uh, Paul said much the same thing. He's chosen the weak things to confound the mighty and things that are not. He has chosen to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. And there's the thing. This is, good. This is God's story, and Jesus is the hero, so we don't get to be the hero. We don't get to be the ones who save the world. We just get to do our own little jobs. And when we do it by faith, trusting Jesus and giving him the glory, God smiles at us and he's well pleased. And that's all we need. You don't have to come away feeling we're the great heroes of the story that made the big difference. Yeah, he but we chose do the, make most, differences. the most amazing means, mm -hmm. which is the word. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, you know, one of the most amazing revolutions in history, the American Revolution, started as a revolution of words, mm -hmm. right? But eventually, it came to blows. They couldn't have done it without swords and guns and no. ships. Um, but that's not how God claims the world. That's not how he wins. He wins 
just through words. It doesn't take any more than that. All right. So Zion, what's Zion? Zion. It's a hill, right? In the middle it's a hill. that we're all going to go to. Yeah. Um, sure. The original Zion, and I, 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 I smile every time I hear you pronounce it Zion because it's undoubtedly correct. I just never say it that way. Wait, wait. Do I say it differently than you do? <laughs> I wasn't even aware. You, you, you pronounce the O as a, as a short O. I do the oh. um, uh, What's oh, that called? The, uh, uh, yeah. The schwa. The schwa. Yeah, I do a schwa. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was originally a hill in and about the city of Jerusalem. When David took Jerusalem, he took that part of it and built a palace, fortified palace there, uh, as as the capital within the capital, the um, the royal territory within within the city that he was now claiming to be the capital of Israel, capital for Yahweh from which God would rule his people, and thus the importance of bringing the ark to Zion. Well, it turned out in time that God wanted to build a temple not on Zion, but on Moriah, the hill next door, as it were. And um, in the meantime, David housed the ark in a little tabernacle. It's called Tabernacle of David, where worship was, was very simple. There were choirs and musical instruments, little, little or no sacrifice going on, no, no barriers or veils, no sprinkling of blood, no elaborate ceremonies. And David, as God's adopted son, could rock right in and sit before the ark in the very presence of God. And when the prophets began to look, look forward to what God would do in history, they spoke not of Solomon's temple in on Mount Moriah, but they always spoke of Zion. And throughout the Psalms and through Isaiah and the Minor Prophets, the common word is Zion. Uh, when we get to the New Testament, we find only a couple really explicit references, that is, references that use that name. I, I will read you one, because it pretty well sums up what the New Testament thinks of all this. Uh, the writer, first of all, tells his listeners, you have not come to Mount Sinai that was dark and fire and tempest and scary and dangerous and all that. And then in verse 22 of chapter 12, he says, but you are come unto Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirit of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Uh, the first thing we have to see is the verb tense, you are come. So speaking to the first century church, the writer of Hebrews could say, well, Zion's here, or you're there. You've come, and in coming there, there's some things that belong to this. First, an innumerable company, well, actually, first he calls it the city of the living God, so the Psalms talk about the city of God. And then the heavenly Jerusalem. Paul had mentioned the heavenly Jerusalem in Galatians, and it comes back in, in the book of Revelation at the end. To an innumerable company of angels. Well, we don't see angels, and most of them seem to be in heaven a good deal of the time, worshiping God. And again, Revelation 4 and 5 shows us that. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. So it encompasses and includes the whole church. And more, God, to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. So there's a unity. We, we've come to the city, and yet it includes not only us who are alive on earth, but those saints who've gone on and, and are with Jesus already. Uh, and to Jesus, we come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to his precious blood. So this is the reality and I think the normal response is something like, well, that sounds really good, but I don't, wh when do we see this? When, when do we experience this? How does this play out? Uh, if I could see this with my eyes, if I could see Jesus, if I could hear the voice of God, if I could feel the, the wind wafted by angels' wings all around me while I hear their songs, then that would be great. It would be so much easier to be a Christian. I'm sure Thomas agrees. 
<laughs> At one point he did. And yet Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. These are things of faith. They're real. Uh, when we come to church to worship God, we come. it used to be common. I, I guess it still is. I'm not that familiar with what all churches do. But it used to be common for the pastor to speak of, we're coming now to, to meet with God. We're coming into the presence of God. Uh, we're all standing before God. And it's easy for those things just kind of roll off of us as if, yeah, yeah, that's the language we're supposed to use because we're in church. No, that's the reality. Mm -hmm. uh, there is, I, I appreciate the usefulness of science fiction sometimes to help explain philosophical and theological concepts. Uh, the idea of dimensional barriers here, I think, may help. Mm -hmm. uh, heaven is not light years away. It's not beyond the rim of the known universe. It's it's close enough, as it were, to reach out and touch if God would let us. It's just a heartbeat away, but it's not here exactly. And yet, when we come and we worship, and, and again, Revelation 4 and 5 show us this um, visually, we come and we worship with angels and saints. Yeah. And the hymns of the church, particularly the older hymns, are full of this kind of language. Uh, you can think of the Te Deum, for instance. Uh, and so this is, we're here, well, is this all there is? And there are some people called, called hyperpreterists who say, yep, this is it. This is as good as it gets. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. False. <Yeah>. Wrong. <laughs> Do not I pass think go. We are, of all people, most to be pitied. <laughs> yes, of this all men, most miserable. If this is it, uh, what we have by faith is incredible and tremendous, but it's only the beginning. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you spoke about recalling things from previous episodes, which for me simply means telling the same stories again, pretty much. <laughs> um, but so I know I've told this story. But when I was a kid, and I was promised you get to go to Disneyland, and we drove down to LA. And for some reason, I thought Disneyland was in LA. I don't know how that happened. But we waited and waited. And it was a long ride. It was long and long. And then finally, here's a sign that says LA City Limits. And I get up and look around and there's nothing. It is <laughs> barren. There's like a couple warehouses or something, you know, a couple miles out in the middle of nowhere. And there is nothing else. And yet, we were in LA. Uh, you can tell if you if you took the trouble, if you broke a law, LA police would arrest you. <laughs> if you didn't pay property taxes to the to the LA city government, people would come and have a serious conversation with you. If you wanted to build something, you had to get permits from LA city government again. The government was real. And although it didn't it wasn't exactly very visible under the right circumstances, it could manifest itself really fast, I'm sure. Uh, if the LA police were chasing someone out of town on a high-speed race down I-5, or up I-5, I guess, they they would know, oh, we just crossed the city limits. Okay, we need the county to pick up, or we need the next county to pick up, or whatever, because our authority just ran out. We'll see if they'll include us. A city does not have to be in its full glory for us to truly be in it and be part of it and part of what it's doing. And so we you don't have to be standing in city hall to be part right. of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet there is a difference to be sure. And so we here in the 21st century are somewhere across the line. Jesus has come. The King has come. Jesus told us the kingdom of heaven is here. It's among you. Uh, he is on the throne. Most of the most of the citizens of the kingdom right now are in heaven. If you cal calculate the possibilities and the population of four thousand um, years of the Old Testament and now two thousand, probably at this moment there are more people in heaven than there are saints on earth. It may not always be that way. Don't know how God's going to work that out. But if you ask, why is this called the kingdom of heaven? Well, the king's in heaven, and the bulk of his people are in heaven. It seems like a good <laughs> name somehow. But that doesn't mean we're not. Uh, we who are who live under the new covenant, which is the, the, the treaty and the constitution for that kingdom, for that city, include us. 
And, and so we, we continue to move towards Zion, toward its fullness. We have the reality, but we don't have the fullness. Just as we are like all... Like the embassy, right? Yes. The outpost. Yeah. And our churches are embassies of the kingdom of heaven, which is why other governmental entities should leave their hands off of them unless they actually <laughs> commit a civil crime by God's standards. But that's something else. Um, and, and so the halting towards Zion, we, we still limp. Jesus has come and he's not limping anymore, but he works through us and we limp a lot. He did not, I, I spoke before of, of him not giving us superpowers, but far more important, he didn't instantaneously deal with all of our sins either. And so he's working through a lot of sinners who've still got a lot of sin they're struggling with and working through. And there is this thing called progressive sanctification, whereby we grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord, and we are conformed more and more to the image of Christ. But it's a slow journey and struggle, and we wrestle with God, and God wrestles with us. He's still got one hand tied behind his back. And he's still got one tied, yeah, very much so. Because if he just released all of his power, there's not much story in that, honestly. <laughs> Sometimes we just reduce it to that. It's a poor joke, and there's no story. Because these two, these are also attributes of God. God the storyteller, God the comedian, God who seeks his own glory more than our comfort, that God. Uh, and, and so we, we can look at the circumstances around us. And, you know, for quite a few decades now, I've been told by usually those older than me that the world's really bad and Jesus is coming back any time soon or... Um, the Marxists are going to walk in and take over and we'll just lie down and let them. And I, I've just seen there's going to be nuclear war. I have seen so many prophecies of doom and gloom. Yeah, same. <laughs> and yet, the world's gotten worse. One of the, one of the memes that showed up on my uh, LinkedIn account was a, a soldier with a, you know, the kind of gas mask thing. And you can't really see his face, just the big goggly eyes. And he's obviously looking back over his shoulder at someone saying, yeah, you're right. The world's a mess. But you know what? It's going to get a lot worse. That's the meme. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it may indeed. Uh, the world today is a lot worse than anything I remember. And I remember a lot. And I was, I was told all the times that the Soviets were going to come and take us over and we'd be sent to labor camps and all those, you know, all that kind of stuff. It never happened. The Soviet Union fell into the dust of history. And yet... What we're seeing today is insane, but yep. it, it, God has not been caught off guard. Mm -hmm. God is not losing. Whatever God does in all this, on the other side, people are going to sit back, say, wow, applaud, and say, what an incredible God. We never saw that coming. Whatever we think the solution is, we're probably wrong, <laughs> except that it will involve, as Emily said, the Word of God. And that's why we do this kind of thing. We There are people who, who come and listen to this podcast because they want to hear a little more of God's Word, or because they want a slightly different slant on it. And as long as they want to listen, I'm willing to go on doing this. Um, but that's halting towards Zion. And uh, we're in process, and we're not there yet. And in the meantime, limping on a bone spur hurts. <laughs> That's life, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, on the subject of continuing to do the podcast, mm -hmm. um, this is an end of sorts, as I've mentioned, but we will be back in January. Um, we are going to begin a new series on world history and church history. Um, the exact configuration uh, is still being settled. Um, the exact outline, how long that arc is going to take. Um, we're still working through all those things because we need a break. <laughs> and that's why we're not releasing until January. Um, but you can expect to see us back then. Um, so watch this space, as people say. <laughs> Sadly, um, Brian will not be joining us for the next arc. And Brian, we're going to miss you a whole lot. You've said so many wonderful and edifying things. Uh, one of the ones that has 
resonated with me and come up in so many different contexts. I think you first said it actually on our test recording episode (laughs) (laughs) and it's it like the theme has run through just almost everything we've talked about um and that's it was relating to common grace Mm. and how god's goodness in the world is all for the sake of his people um Mm. that is god's wonderful gift to us um that's how we how we experience it all those all those things that are are ongoing in the world that we wish weren't there all the problems they're there because the tares are allowed to grow up for the sake of the wheat so thank you very much for that and for all of all of your contributions it's been a real joy working with you the thank things you. that you've said that have blessed me the most have to do with the being in nature of god mm-hmm. both your own comments and the books you've recommended mm-hmm. um uh, theology proper is not an area that most Christians, most pastors, even most seminary professors spend a lot with either. In some form, take it for granted. Either, yeah, well, yeah, there's God, now let's get on to something interesting. Or, <laughs> surely everybody knows what I know about God, so there's no need to repeat it. There's so many things about who God is. I, I know you've spent a good deal of time, as I have, talking about the simplicity of God and all that's involved in that. Uh, and I really appreciate you coming back to who God is again and again, because it is absolutely key. I've been accused of not being able to get out of Genesis, but <laughs> more and more, I'm not getting very far away from God and himself, the attributes of God, God as creator and God as trinity. When, until, the, until you've thought through that a lot, you really don't know where you're going next. And you have been very, very good to keep bringing us back there and to recommend really sound books uh, and materials that keep us thinking about that. And of course, the thing I appreciate about you and about Emily both is your constant taking us back to the gospel. Uh, it's it's constantly, it's about Jesus' blood and righteousness. It's about God's verdict, not our works. Uh, yeah. And unfortunately, there are a lot of Christian broadcasters and podcasters and whatever who believe that, and yet trying to find it in, in their writing and their talking is sometimes problematic. And so thank you, Brian, especially, since you're going on, and, and Emily too, of course, that that has remained a focus of what we've done here. Because if we don't got that, we don't got anything. Mm-hmm. So who is God and how is he our Savior? Because yeah. we're not our Savior and we're not God. I suppose if there's a pivot point for this podcast, it's those things. So yes, thank you, Brian, very much for all your contributions. And also, I just absolutely, I've loved your your ducks yeah. and your <laughs> garden and uh, all those homey touches about life in the frozen Netherlands. Uh, <laughs> The, the and of course, you're all, yes, and of course, you're always welcome to come back anytime you want for mm-hmm. this or that or for some new series or whatever. In the meantime, enjoy your wife, your family, and um, may God give you a job that you can really sink your teeth into and with which you can do wonderful things. Well, thank you for all of that. Um, yes, I've I've really appreciated being able to talk about things that are of interest to me that uh you you could say our our hobby horses and uh mm. soapbox uh, subjects um especially in the past probably it's probably been 3 years the the doctrine of of just like you said theology proper has revealed it I don't want to say it's been revealed to me as super important it was always yeah. super important <laughs> but um it's it's one of those kind of things, like you said, it's overlooked or yeah. pushed aside, but there's so much beauty to it. And really, if you don't, you can understand the gospel without knowing all of the nitty gritty, mm-hmm. all the all the itty tiny details about hypostases and usia and other Greek words that I can flex <laughs> my reading <laughs> knowledge with. Um but if you're going to go into higher levels of study, personal study or for ministry, it, it is of 
invaluable importance. It it is pastoral knowledge mm, to yeah. know this theology, and that was the realization I had in 2020 ish. Is every, everything else that I've uh, other theo- theological topics that I've studied have also been very pastoral. Mm-hmm. Um, the kind of reclaiming the idea of the law gospel distinction for reformed theology. Cause it's there, it's there in the Westminster. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not called that, but it's called like covenant of grace, covenant of works. Mm-hmm. Cause but we yeah. didn't have CFW Walther, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. Yes. Um, but yeah, like if I, if I could ever boil down like the things that I think are most important besides Jesus' work and and life and resurrection and coming again. Let's put those all into one <laughs> section. It would be theology proper, uh, divine simplicity, um, and inseparable operations being two mm. really important parts of that, and the law gospel distinction because. Both of the uh, both of those categories of theology, just inside of them, is I, I guess in the in these two categories of theology is rest for the soul. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's saying, look, you you should respond to grace with a change of heart. Yeah, but you don't get the grace by the change of heart. Right. Mm-hmm. And it also says, I think I may have mentioned this actually in the past couple of episodes. I don't remember for sure. One of the really important things and a pastoral application of something that seems like a heady doctrine, like just ivory tower kind of stuff, like inseparable operations or divine simplicity is the practical application. If God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are one in essence and one in will, and everything that one of them does is technically an act of all three members of the Trinity in the Godhead. That means that there is no distinction between the love of God the Son in Jesus on the cross and the love that God the Father has for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And I, I see so many people... Uh, even in my own personal circles, that they feel God the Father is distant and harsh and uncaring and unkind. Mm-hmm. And that it's only just, it's Jesus really just being this advocate gang. Hey, trust me, he's really good. You can you can trust this guy. He's with me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That gets God the Father on your side. And otherwise, yes. he's just kind of like, oh, you again? I don't care about you, but my son vouches for you. Yeah, That's not the case. It's never the case. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Some of those things I've been saying in our Wednesday night Bible study a good deal. And and you're right. The, the things you started with are the things that lead here. You, once you know who God is and how what the Trinity is all about, it's not just a simple uh, formula. One <laughs> essence, three persons. That doesn't even come close to what's going on there. But it ends up with something so so utterly practical and comforting. Yeah. Like we, we have been invited into the very heart of, of the triune God and the love that flows between the Father and Son and the Spirit is the love He has for us. Yeah, Calvinism is not cold, <laughs> <laughs> except when we don't really understand it and think we do, and that's always <laughs> a problem. But there's so much richness here, and so again, thank you for bringing so much of that richness to this program. You're very welcome. Any other fond memories to close us out of the show? I, I actually, I will go first. You go first. Fond memory. Um, this particular fond memory of the show was when <laughs> I wasn't on it. <laughs> and um, David and David and David oh, yes. were on the show. Ah. Um, and they were talking about being a scientist who is a Christian, mathematician who is a Christian, um, and how that fits in with the Christian life? And the answer is not, you have to study creation science and why evolution is wrong. Like that's not what it means at heart to be a scientist who is a Christian. Mm, What it means to be a scientist who is a Christian is that you go to work and you work (laughs) and you work with other scientists and you're a Christian among them. You know, it's, it's your daily business. 
Um, and I just, I thought that was so edifying and I was so thankful to be able to sit back and listen to that. Uh, I think one of my favorite kind of things looking back, and it's not so much, I have a terrible memory for anecdotes, uh, especially in something over three years long that we've done. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember where I was when things, like when we were meeting, obviously the past couple of years, it's been here at my house. Uh, but there was a stretch of time. I just remember how much fun it was working out of my hometown. I had moved to do a job uh, on the coast and being the only one in the office holding up in one of the meeting rooms, completely empty floor of a office building and opening up the laptop and, and joining and doing this while looking out over the city skyline <laughs> to, mm -hmm. you know, to my right. And just how, how much fun that, that really was. And, and then I think as far as like the podcast itself, there's, there, there are f other funny things, more like recurring themes, like um, in the first couple of years of, of doing this, the, the, the Gnosticism bell. Oh that, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. That Michael um, bought for us. <laughs> ah, yes. Uh, the Gnosticism bell. And then me forgetting how many times I've already recommended that hideous strength. <laughs> yes, so uh, many times. <laughs> It's just such an easy answer. It's so it's so <laughs> relevant. <laughs> People telling us we should have a list of all these recommendations, and we say, "Yeah, you're right. We should." And yep. Never did. Yeah. yeah. Mm. <laughs> well, we did for about the first half of the show when I was doing show notes. Speaking uh, of, <laughs> speaking that of was those were some of my favorite parts of the show. I know that wasn't on the show exactly, <laughs> but I loved your summaries. Uh, using <laughs> backhanded cliches and allusions to other things to communicate what was going on. And I always look forward to seeing how you're going to phrase something and then say, wait, <laughs> what in the world is she talking about? Oh, I get it. You're talking about the this episode features section? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And those were a lot of fun. As were the again. memes you did. And I still continue to cite them in other contexts. <laughs> Um, Glad to be of service. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, well, thank you both so much for this conversation, for three and a half years of conversation. It's been a delight. Big thank yous also to David, our producer and my lawfully wedded husband, to our financial supporters, to everyone who sent in recommendations, to all our listeners for tuning in. We so appreciate the opportunity to do this. And we will see you in January. Bye.